Ana Maria, putem începe? Da? Ok. So, ladies and gentlemen, it is my uh, my privilege to uh, introduce to you and uh, open quite a challenging panel called coronavirus and the reshaping of the global order. The subject is challenging and the panelists are, I think, I think up to the tasks. Um, so it will be a challenge for me to moderate uh, such a distinguished uh, bunch of, of speakers. Before uh, giving the floor to the, uh, to the panelists, I will have some small technical uh, comments. Interventions of about eight to, uh, to 10 minutes to allow for questions and answers. We should be ending our discussions about a quarter to, uh, to one. Um, we will take up the questions or comments after uh, all the speakers have taken the floor to allow for uh, a more comprehensive uh, roundup. But before uh, getting into the gist of the, the matter, allow me to make some comments, personal comments, on this, uh, this uh, topic. I was thinking, where can we start from? And I took a reference point in uh, the uh, conference, Munich Security Conference, which launched a very interesting concept, which I think is still valid, Westlessness. Actually, it was dealing with the, what was called then revisiting the West. It was an audit of where we are in terms of our heritage, values, principles, uh, when we feel that the building, the construction, is subject to, uh, let's say, complex tensions and uh, gathering storms. So if we uh, think at the 4th of March, when uh, the Munich Security Conference started, we can recall that the pandemic was declared officially by the World Health Organization on the 9th of March. But if we look at the uh, this debates and the subjects, we shall see that whatever was discussed then is still, is still valid, there is a constant, but we have to add the pandemic to uh, what has, has been put there on the table, and which we find in the conference which has started uh, to uh, yesterday. And I was thinking, where can we start? Uh, should we start with um, the Industrial Revolution? If we mention Adam Smith, who will, think, who will think of the wealth of nations? We can mention the American Revolution. But in Europe, uh, the triggering point for a new era was the French Revolution. And uh, I happened to stumble 
uh, on a quotation uh, from, uh, uh, from Goethe at the beginning of the French, uh, French Revolution. Um, and uh, in, 17, 18, uh, in 1792, uh, when uh, he said uh, that uh, those witnessing that moment can say that they were present at the birth of, the, of a new world. Now, uh, let us come to, uh, to the present from those remarks of Goethe. Yesterday, the chief of staff of the Romanian Air Force was uh, mentioning that um, uh, the uh, uh, approach to strategy during the Napoleonic Wars between, and he mentioned Napoleon and Wellington, was topographic. Today it is omnidirectional. Uh, I want to apply this, uh, uh, let's say, military uh, metaphor uh, to the uh, whole body of social and political uh, law, because this is what we are witnessing uh, today. So, uh, my question to the speakers would be the following. Are we witnessing the dawn of a new era, breaking the foundations on which the heritage of our identity has been established? Or uh, whether the challenges of the day are yet another stage in a long-term expansion of a project which has originated in Europe a long time ago and now lives through the avatars of globalization. So, for sure, everything, something new is uh, emerging, but we still have the constants of the horror vacui in power relations and the ever accompanying process attempting to regulate the functioning of the world system. With this introduction, uh, I have the privilege to uh, introduce our uh, first speak uh, speaker, a good friend of the New Strategy Center, and uh, I can say a good friend of ours. I am speaking of Dr. Charles Powell, the director of the Elcano Royal Institute, uh, whose uh, uh, CV uh, is, uh, how to say, very modest as to the weight of his intellectual uh, gifts. Professor of uh, Contemporary History at San Pablo University, uh, lecturer in Corpus Christi, uh, Oxford, uh, fellow at uh, the University College in Oxford, uh, in Oxford but uh, more recently, as we all know, director of Elcano and uh, advisor to uh, 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 His Majesty the, the King of Spain for foreign, for international affairs. So, dear Charles, you, you, have, the, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Um, it's wonderful to be taking part in this event. Um, good morning to everyone. I'm very sorry that I can't be with you uh, in person. Um, to answer your question very briefly, attempt to answer your question very briefly, I studied history at Oxford, and in our first term, we had to read Thomas, uh, Thomas Macaulay's uh, famous History of England, which is regarded as one of the um, major contributions to what's known as the Whig interpretation of history. And, and, and I basically still adhere to this Whig interpretation of history. In other words, I believe in progress, and I believe um, that although, as you, as you clearly said, um, we are on the threshold of uh, major changes, um, basically, my interpretation of the pandemic is that it has accelerated trends that were already in place. Um, and that's why I came back to you with this idea that perhaps we should start by quoting uh, Charles Dickens's A Tale of Two Cities, which of course is um, Dickens's greatest historical novel, and it's about the French Revolution. And as you all may recall, the opening paragraph it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light, it was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair, 
We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. Um, and my remarks basically going to deal with how the pandemic is changing uh, the global order, uh, what we used to call the liberal international order, although the concept is now also in dispute to some extent. But my essential argument, uh, my point of departure, is that we have been transitioning towards a new kind of order um, for almost 30 years now, since the fall of the Berlin Wall and um, the collapse of the Soviet Union. And we are in still in transition towards the new order, and we are still really uh, not very clear as to what this new order will consist of. Um, I like the idea of restlessness, but it's basically, I suppose, simply a different way of um, phrasing the slogan of our time, which is the decline of the West and the rise of the rest. So my fundamental pitch then is that the pandemic is accelerating trends and tendencies that were already in place. Um, as far as globalization is concerned, for example, we, we are probably moving towards a more fragmented and perhaps a more regionalized version of globalization. Globalization may be accelerating in some areas, for example, online teaching, um, but obviously it may be changing in other areas such as transport and, and tourism, quite obviously. So the um, first point I'd like to make is, what have we observed from Europe as a result of the pandemic? The first thing I think we've observed, or the first consequence, is that there has uh, the reputation of the United States has been seriously undermined. We were all very, I think many Europeans were all concerned by the Trump administration's blatant hostility to both the philosophy and, and the reality of European integration. And this is to some extent unprecedented since European integration had occurred under the US security umbrella. I think it's inconceivable without it. So EU integration is very much part of the post-World War II liberal international order. We know, for example, from uh, John Bolton's fascinating, though very bizarre book, The Room Where It Happened, that Donald Trump likes to refer to the EU, likes to say that the EU is like China, only smaller. Um, but there's a very interesting poll carried out at the height of the pandemic by the European Council on Foreign Relations, um, according to which only 1% of Germans, uh, French or Spaniards, identified the US as their country's most important ally during the pandemic, during the crisis. And in fact, 68% of the French people polled and 65% of the Germans polled say that their view of the US has worsened significantly uh, during the crisis. I think it's probably fair to say that the US's inability to handle uh, its domestic health crisis internally has undermined European faiths not only in the, Europe, in the US political system, but also perhaps it's raised doubts about um, the US's ability to defend Europe. Um, and of course, I think many of us in Europe have, always been, have also been quite shocked at the Trump administration's attempts to undermine multilateral organizations trying to deal with the pandemic, such, most notably the World Health Organization. I think the point is that the US hasn't just turned its back on the world, failing to provide leadership, it was turned against global institutions, it was so uh, crucial in setting the aftermath of World War II. In short, the US has abdicated its role as the world's indispensable nation. Now, interestingly, according to this poll and other studies, the pandemic has also undermined the reputation of China, although admittedly somewhat uh, less so. For example, only 4% of the French and 2% of the Germans um, who were interviewed for these polls say that China was their most important ally. And in fact, 62% of the French and 48% of the Germans say that their view of China has worsened. Why is this? I think the reasons are quite clear. The Chinese um, were economical with the truth about the origins of the pandemic. They gave away or sold defective medical supplies. They have implemented Russian-style disinformation campaigns and they have stepped up their repression in Hong Kong and their um, irredentist policies towards uh, Taiwan. So overall, I think we can say that Chinese efforts to step into the vacuum left by the US 
have been a clumsy and far from successful. China is obviously not in the position to pr provide global leadership. So if this is the case, what are the alternatives? Well, optimists, idealists, hoped that the pandemic would foster international cooperation and perhaps lead to a radical overhaul and even a relaunching of the United Nations system. Um, I think this is sadly highly unlikely, at least, of course, because it would require the consensus of the five permanent members of the Security Council to, to agree to it. So where does this leave us? Well, according to uh, Richard Haas and other representatives of what we might call the realist hegemonic stability theory school of uh, international relations, it leaves us uh, on the highway to hell, basically. Um, this school of thought has always argued that the benign hegemon provides rules that govern the international order and underwrites the system's stability with its military power. And they've also argued for years that when the hegemon declines or is unwilling to perform its role, the system becomes unstable and this leads to its eventual collapse. I think in truth, the US, we all know now, began to abandon its hegemonic responsibility a long while ago. I think it's important to understand that a Joe Biden victory, however welcome and comforting it may be, uh, will not significantly alter this. I think we should stop looking for a hegemonic savior that no longer exists. So are we uh, condemned? Are we doomed to this uh, dystopian future, which um, this past has, has, has described as a global landscape of great power rivalry, nuclear pro proliferation, weak states, Searching refugee flows and growing nationalism. By the way, some cynics might argue that this is actually the world we live in already, in spite of the description of what we already have. My answer, um, and this is my optimistic pitch today, is that this is not necessarily the case, and that the crisis, um, the, the crisis offered by the pandemic, um, may mark the beginning of a transformation of the global order from one dominated by a single state or a small number of states to a more inclusive system of global governance. And by the way, let me remind you all that in the West, I think we often forget that in many parts of the world, and thinking of Latin America, Asia, Africa, the old uh, liberal order was never really seen as a, as a system that served them particularly well. So in these regions, the passing of the old system uh, is not causing too much anguish. So my optimistic pitch here would be then that the waning of US hegemony uh, opens up new possibilities for more decentralized democratic systems of global governance involving genuine cooperation among a critical mass of nations. And just to conclude, um, I think two alternative scenarios uh, for the future are already emerging in this regard. The first would be what we might call a thick but narrow vision or order with a dense set of agreements and shared commitments centered on liberal democracies, essentially. And of course, today, there's a bit of talk of strengthening ties between like-minded democracies. And I, I take heart, for example, in the EU's recent uh, economic partnership agreement with Japan, which was signed at the outbreak of the pandemic. In itself, I think this strategy has quite a lot of potential don't forget that six out of 10 states in the world are now democracies, but of course, some major states will continue to be authoritarian, and China, of course, is the most important case in point. The second vision, or the second option, would be a thin but broad version of liberal internationalism with minimal principles and institutions for coping with major 21st century challenges, climate change, weapons of mass destruction, and of course, pandemics like the current one. And incidentally, it will very, be very interesting to see how the international community deals with the um, implementation of the COVID-19 vaccine once it becomes available. And there are lots of examples of this kind of um, large but thin um, version, for example, the UN's 2030 Agenda, the Sustainable Development, or the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement. And finally, the point I want to make here is that, of course, these two options are not mutually exclusive. And for the time being, uh, perhaps this is the best that we can hope for. So to conclude then, I think this future order will be less normatively convergent, but also more inclusive, less institutionalized, but more flexible, and less stable, but perhaps more resilient. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Powell. Our expectations were fulfilled with you uh, opening uh, this session um, and looking forward to uh, the questions and answers later. Now it is my privilege to uh, introduce to you uh, Minister Lazar Comanescu, two times uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, and uh, I would say one of the pillars of uh, Romania's uh, membership process of accession both to NATO and the European Union. And I had the privilege to accompany him for a couple of decades in this process. Doctor in economy, so he is blending the virtues of the diplomatist and the globalist and negotiator with those uh, uh, having an economic background, and currently uh, senior advisor to the Chamber of uh, President of the Chamber of Commerce of Romania. Dear Minister Comanescu, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And uh, I think that we can see, yeah, we can still say good morning, everybody. We are still uh, before noon. Well, let me start by saying that I'm really pleased to participate in this fourth edition of the Plexi Security Forum. Uh, and uh, I'd like to congratulate uh, the organizers for providing us with the almost perfect setup. Uh, and I'm saying that not to please somebody, or if, but really because I, that's what I feel and I, I, I think that I pretend to have a little bit of experience about this type of meetings. And so really congratulations. I am really pleased also and honored to uh, be part of this panel alongside uh, most distinguished participant and uh, most distinguished knowledgeable persons. Now coming to the topic of our panel. Uh, given the time constraints and picking up from uh, what Ambassador Maguero spelled out as part of my CV, I would limit myself to some brief considerations mainly on the economic dimension of the global order and the pandemics and uh, the pandemic's impact thereon. Well, I'm not sure whether uh, uh, I'll come to uh, be at the level of the expectations uh, our moderator has raised there upon. Nevertheless, I'll try to say something. So, but before being more specific, just one remark of a rather more general nature. Okay, we've uh, been uh, with the, accompanied by the pandemics for now more than eight months, almost. And uh, we see that the opinion is widely shared that the world after the pandemic will be different of the, the one before it, or some would say totally different. There is talk about the end of globalization, or of the liberal and uh, rule-based international order being tether, in tethers. Geopolitics, some people say, with uh, national powers in the center is coming back as the driving force of the international relations. There may be substance therein, but we still need to deepen our reflections before making clear pronouncements. Not least because, unfortunately, the pandemic is still there, Uh, producing uh, huge effects, not just in, uh, in the sanitary field, 
but in economy as well. So I think that we still need, before coming with, uh, let's say, comprehensive and final conclusions, we still need quite a lot of, of analysis at deep reflection. Some considerations, however, can be made, but I have to say from the very outset that they can only be intermediary or preliminary. My first uh, comment uh, I'll say that beyond and the objectively still incomplete evaluations of its impact on the health as well as beyond the disruptions and the, the competition it has generated at the global level in the search of remedying the impact, the COVID-19 pandemic has already produced and will continue to produce very serious economic consequences, which in their turn impact heavily on the global system. That makes me share those views according to which the future global competition, a new Cold War perhaps, in economic terms first, will to a great extent be about trade and rules and standards. The degree of openness of the latter are extremely important in this respect, as, for example, what we see as the debate about using, introducing uh, the 5G indicates. My second consideration, globalization will not only not disappear, but interdependencies will become even stronger. Because global challenges like climate change, pandemics, to which I would add aspects of which are not directly related to the economy, but to a proliferation of weapons or mass destructions, uh, assertiveness of uh, non-state actors, and the fact that the economies have become so in interwined, make inward-looking policies and decouplings impossible, even in the case of the strongest and largest economies. And I'll simply remind, I've read very recently an article uh, by the a former Deputy Secretary of the United States, William Burns, saying that, uh, referring to US-China economic relations, that uh, in his terms, I mean, uh, he says that, he said something, said something like that, that uh, even if there is determination to decouple, that would be impossible. So uh, something, if this, this type of uh, pronouncements are coming from a quite knowledgeable guy, I think that one should take that into account. My third comment, as we know, at the beginning measures and actions uh, to face the challenges of the pandemics were almost entirely, if not exclusively, at national level. While a lot of criticism, blames, blamings and accusations went on into international and regional organizations. United Nations, particularly World Health Organization, but also, you may remember, criticisms addressed to the Brussels institutions. Those criticisms may be justified, but one should also recognize that the main reasons of weaknesses derives from the fact that uh, those institutions were not provided neither, either with the competencies and even resources to challenge, to, to face these challenges. And, well, member states didn't want to give those organizations enough means and competencies. On, in such a context, yes, the idea that the multilateralism is also highly affected or even uh, 
demolished is there. But as I said already before, so these interdependencies are so, so evident that it made step by step to quote somebody here in Romania, a very important person. Evolved, the positions have evolved, and uh, an increased awareness about the inevitability of the stronger interdependencies is there. And uh, when you look into what has been done in, in between, uh, kind of, let's say, revival of uh, the activities of, some of the international organizations, and I'm thinking first and foremost to the, to the European Union and especially the European Commission with the launching of the uh, new generation EU program, uh, clearly indicates that the awareness is there about the fact that there is no solution unilateral or national in this type of challenges, but only a multilateral one. Therefrom come uh, my fourth observation, but still on interdependence. What I want to say is that one shouldn't ignore the fact that uh, the uh, engine of the global economic growth will be in the future the Asian Indo-Pacific area. I think it's, some, it's extremely important to take into account. If you look into the statistics already, and uh, what the pandemics has, inter alia, if not primarily, brought to the fore is the need of rethinking, in some respects, the functioning of the market economy. I particularly have in mind the clear need of a, an appropriate balance between seeking the maximization of profit, one of the basics of the market economy, and securing resilience. It seems to me that the relocation, this debate and even actions aiming at relocations of industries is the beginning of an answer to this need of balance between uh, basics of the market economy and resilience. And here as well, when talking about these relocations, as of now, that's my personal opinion. It's, of course, generated by the, the, the lack of uh, masks and so on, but, uh, as it was at the beginning. And there is, I hear, and people saying that, well, it's, it's not okay. Now we, we are depending on very much on uh, external, uh, on other uh, actors, which is true up to a point. And here comes what I want to say is that when uh, proceeding to these relocations, we have to, one has to take into account the balance between costs and, I mean, uh, and, and, and uh, well, take into account appropriately the existence or not of competitive and comparative advantages. And again, it's again about the uh, rules and standards on the basis of which trade is carried out. My fifth consideration, which derives from the previous one, is about multilateralism versus bilateralism in the establishment of the rules and standards. Bilateral arrangements are most beneficial so long as they are in line with multilateral agreed, multilaterally agreed frameworks and rules. Should they evolve outside such a framework, for example, uh, protectionism, containment measures, and so on, that may bring short-term benefits, but on long term, they certainly become disruptive. And hence the importance of a solid, multilaterally agreed and implemented 
set of rules and standards based on principles and values that prove to be genuine engineers of the progress. And here, I really think that, and history shows us that, that the values, those values which we usually, or which are usually uh, named Western values, prove to be the basis on which these standards and rules can be set up. And that means, first and foremost, that uh, well, both the, the European Union and the United States, plus their like-minded partners in other parts of the world, they have a key role in determining such an evolution. And in such a context, I would say that resumption of the TTIP negotiations would be extremely important. And, uh, well, my sixth comment is about realism and pragmatism. As I said, competi well, competition has been there and will continue to be there among the global actors and the current pandemics, perhaps more than the crisis, other crises, shows that the competition does not only persist, but it is of strengthening, sharpening. And I hear, I see, and I fully agree with what uh, has been said yesterday, if I'm not mistaken, by Professor Daniel Diano. It seems that, it seems that it's coming, becoming more and more clear that this, this sharpening competition would be mainly among big actors, but also regional groupings. Uh, the challenges, the global challenges, I, I already mentioned, and of course, pandemics is one of, uh, uh, among them, should provide enough arguments to acknowledge that the, there is room and need for cooperation even among competitors and rivals. And here, I think that the European Union deserves to be commended for the way how they conceived the strategy, the approach towards relationship with China. I think it's an example to provide some source of inspiration for others as well. And yeah, my seventh and last uh, remark, developments during the pandemics proved to be yet another confirmation of uh, one of what one of the founders of the European Union has said. The EU is forged by during and through crisis. And that, by so doing, the EU is becoming more and more integrated. And indeed, if we uh, look into the already mentioned new generation EU program of recovery and resilience, this is, in my opinion, well, I would say it's my opinion, but it, I fully share the opinion that that's the most important step towards deepening the integration inside the European Union since the adoption of the euro. And that's an encouraging point about the strengthening the role, the role of the European Union, because, well, there are people who say that uh, the next, uh, I mean, uh, frame, the next uh, atmosphere in a global atmosphere would be determined by a bipolar uh, let's say relationship. I sincerely hope and I think that it is a must that the European Union be involved and contribute to a real and genuine multilateral mutually beneficial order. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, we shall cross the channel, so to say, uh, on uh, on the cliffs of Dover, 
and uh, uh, very briefly introducing uh, Professor Christopher Cocker from the London School of uh, Economics, uh, part of that, uh, uh, how to say, uh, uh, very distinguished uh, uh, branch uh, mingling scholarship academia with strategic uh, uh, thinking. We are sorry not to be able to have you here uh, again, but we are looking forward to, uh, to your contribution. Um, uh, an impressive CV, but my recommendation to you would be to look into the rich bibliography uh, uh, of his authorship, because there you will find the necessary uh, insight. Uh, Professor, I am giving you the floor, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And first of all, can I thank um, the, uh, my hosts today um, for the very close uh, working relationship that we've had in the past uh, two years. It's been very, very productive, and I hope it will continue. Let me take up where uh, Charles Powell uh, left. He, in a sense, he started with, or began, I should say, he started with a quotation from uh, Charles Dickens. Can I start with a quotation from a contemporary French novelist, Michel Welbeck? who says, um, I don't believe for a moment in declarations like nothing will be the way it was before. We won't wake up in a new world. It will be the same, only a bit worse. Well, that, of course, is typical Gallic pessimism. Uh, and Welbeck, if you know him from his novel, uh, Submission a few years back, bestseller in France, is rather pessimistic about the future. But it's a very useful quotation, I think, because if we go back to the idea that uh, Goethe put forward, that he was between two eras, I would suggest that we are between two eras, but the second is likely, unfortunately, to be stillborn, and that will make the world a far more dangerous place than it has been becoming for the last few years. So um, my thesis is simply this, that we live between two eras. We live in the present era, which is a Westphalian world, still, of great powers, nation states, which still play geopolitical games. We've touched upon geopolitics. Geopolitics is back with a vengeance. And we live in what should be a post-Westphalian world, uh, dealing with post-Westphalian issues, such as global pandemics and, of course, climate change. And for my students, climate change is really the only security issue that they are interested in. Indeed, they should be, because Every day we open a newspaper, we see the effects of climate change, which are far more radical than we suspected 10 years ago, and which require far greater international cooperation than we've ever seen before in history, and far greater international cooperation than we have at that moment. Now, let's just remind ourselves that this Westphalian world we've lived in for three centuries. So Goethe was living in it at the time that he was looking forward to a new era. It's been shaped by three principles, which are so dear to all orders, including the liberal order, uh, national sovereignty, uh, non-intervention in the affairs of sovereign states, and a consent-based international law. And these uh, principles are fine for the Westphalian order, but they don't exactly help you mitigate the worst consequences of pandemics, for example. And I want to remind you of what almost became a pandemic in 2003, which was SARS. And according to the World Health Organization, we came within weeks of the present crisis back in 2003. And it's been called by David uh, Fidler, who is a specialist in global health, first post face Westphalian pathogen. And it didn't become a pandemic in 2003 because of unprecedented international cooperation at the very beginning. And if we'd had similar cooperation back in December and January, we wouldn't be broadcasting now uh, online. We would be, I would be with you in person today. And let's just remind ourselves that the, we've had three major outbreaks in five years. We've had the Ebola crisis, we've had MERS, and we've had uh, Zika. Three major crises in five years, all contained, fortunately, 
but all revealing the absence of the type of international cooperation that we need to prevent another pandemic. This is a mild one. The next one, most epidemiologists are quite convinced, will put this one in the shade. So um, one of the complicating factors, and this reinforces the point that the present pandemic has amplified existing trends, which were there long before it appeared in Wuhan, one of the complicating factors has been the attack on the very concept of globalization, which began really with the financial crisis of 2008, an attack on ideas of interdependence, an attack on the very idea of international cooperation. Interdependence and international cooperation do not come uh, from the lips of people like Donald Trump, from the people who delivered Brexit in the United Kingdom, from uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil, from President, uh, uh, sorry, from uh, Modi in India, or Italy's Five Star Movement. We've also seen growing nationalism in the United States, in India, in China, in Russia, and within the countries of the European Union. And this has accelerated the growing primacy of geopolitics. I think the COVID crisis has just reinforced negative emotions. It's uh, enforced a sense of victimization and of humiliation. And these negative emotions, of course, have uh, always fueled conflict in the past. It's reinforced deep anxieties and fears. For example, the fear of, uh, of decline in the United States Nine out of 10 Americans now see China as a threat. And that in itself is uh, unfortunate, but it's particularly unfortunate at a time of low national self-esteem. And many Americans are feeling low national self-esteem because of how the virus has played out in their own country. And China doesn't escape from this either because although it has recovered faster, indeed its economy is one of the few not to have gone into recession in the past quarter. There's no doubt that the party and the government, which did not act as well as it should have done, uh, fears its continuing uh, grip on power and will play up Chinese nationalism uh, as a card that can serve its own interests. And what the pandemic has shown is that nationalism is becoming more aggressive. Nationalism doesn't always have to be aggressive. It can be passive aggressive, but it's aggressive. And I just point you to two uh, factors that we've seen with this crisis. One is the growth of racism in the international system, shorn of its social Darwinist ideology. It's not the racism of the 1930s, but it is going to become, I think, a major factor in international politics whether it was the Chinese blaming African, African uh, migrant workers, resident workers in China itself, whether it's Africans blaming the Chinese, whether it's Americans blaming the Chinese, the famous Wuhan virus, whether it's Hindu nationalists in India, which you may remember at the very beginning of this crisis argued that Muslims had tried to spread the disease deliberately. And then the second factor, which has already been uh, mentioned and referred to, is the deliberate use of disinformation, uh, especially by Russia, which undermines our efforts to deal with the virus and unfortunately undermines social cohesion at home. And these have been well documented by the EU External Action Service. So my thesis is a very simple one, and I will conclude on this, that in this febrile environment, trust is declining fast. You can see it over the competition for vaccines, and we haven't seen anything yet. Competition will continue to grow. And the type of cooperation that prevented SARS back in 2003 from becoming a global pandemic, I think looks as though it will be absent from the next challenge, which will come, I think, sooner rather than later. And in the absence of trust, we will find ourselves living in a far more dangerous world. So uh, this era that we should be trying to forge in order to deal with the next crisis uh, is I think at the moment looking as though it will be stillborn. We'll have to see what happens in future. Thank you. Thank you, uh, 
very much, uh, Professor, for this, uh, I would say, baroque or cosmic view on what is expecting us. Um, now uh, it is uh, uh, my turn to switch to a different angle of, uh, of this rich uh, panel um, to uh, our colleague, Ms. Antonia Colibashano, who is a distinguished uh, political analyst with uh, geopolitical futures of Romania and uh, uh, a close uh, collaborator of uh, George Friedman, uh, whom uh, most of us, most of you us here know. Um, she is a, a lecturer at the National School of uh, Political Administrative Studies, a PhD in International Business and International Economics at the University of Bucharest, and a graduate of um, uh, the Georgetown um, uh, University. And one of the experts of our close region, which yesterday was approached under uh, uh, the title, uh, Moscow does not uh, believe in tears. Ms. Kolibashanu, you have the floor. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you for inviting me. Uh, and thank you for uh, uh, presenting uh, my expertise, so to say. Um, that kind of changes my presentation, I have to say, because now that you mentioned the region, it means that I actually have to say things about the region. So um, I will start um, my brief presentation uh, with a global reach and then turn to Europe and to our neighborhood. Uh, first, um, the major elements that uh, the pandemic has changed or has accelerated um, have been already underway uh, globally. Uh, and that is, um, first of all, the terminology and the definition of critical infrastructure. We were talking and have been talking for a decade now about energy security and critical infrastructure that relates to energy and also importing notions from the digital world to support critical infrastructure. With the pandemic, however, uh, we are now having the digital world as uh, critical infrastructure and the sanitary um, world as critical infrastructure as well. Um, then the other trend um, that was undergoing before the pandemic hit us uh, was the growing difference and the acceleration of two uh, major phenomena worldwide. The difference between urbanization and ruralization in the sense of the urban world being very much different from whatever happens in the rural. And the rural meaning something more than just the villages, but the non-urban. Uh, that means access to the digital world, access to energy, and so on. Um, that also means differences at the social level between classes uh, that was undergoing before the pandemic and only accelerated through um, the pandemic and will accelerate. Now, the third element, which is more geopolitical, is the growing protectionism, uh, which obviously has uh, reason as a theme as socioeconomic problems arose. Um, and obviously that has to do with nation states more than international organizations. So it is from the bottom up uh, that society and changes within the society uh, kind of made very popular <laughs> geopolitical analysis. So while geopolitics did exist beforehand um, and uh, only um, was related to discussions because I, I do not remember a time when nation states stopped negotiating between themselves, even within international organizations. It is now very popular, it is fashionable even, to talk about geopolitics. So uh, globally, going to geopolitics only, Another trend that was accelerated was the role of the U.S. in the world. 
Obviously, we are talking and have been talking for a while now about the Asia pivot, about the withdrawal of the US from the global affairs. Something that was less visible before Trump administration and very much visible so that it kind of bothered us all <laughs> during Trump administration. So that to say that the US is only going back to being an island, but not dramatically and not now. It has been a process undergoing for some years and it has a process of strategic change uh, in focus. That means that the US only withdrew from the Middle East, really. And in the Middle East, it didn't quite fully withdraw. I mean, if we look at the Lebanese crisis, um, we almost see that the French are being backed by the US right now, even if obviously Washington hopes that they will not be called in as they've been before by the French. Um, so, obviously, it is not that the U.S. doesn't want and d doesn't, isn't there anymore, but it is there in another way that it has been there. The focus has shifted on another alliance in the Pacific, because the island that we are talking about, the American island, is an island between two oceans. And while the Atlantic has become less of a focus because we don't have a war in Europe and we hopefully remain without a war in Europe. Uh, the Pacific has China, which is changing its role into a regional and global power and makes the US being afraid of it. However, the fear that the US has on China is the fear that a client has on its main supplier because China is dependent on the US market. It is very much different that uh, we are seeing today the war between China and the US. It is very much different than the world between the US and the USSR. It is a cold war. It is an economic war. And it is one that relates to strictly supply chains for now and technology. So as this happens, it is also that the U.S. is supporting the alliance in the Pacific and focusing on its old alliance and strategic focus in Europe. So while it hopes that the EU maintains tied together, the focus of the U.S. is relating to, the, to Eurasia is uh, similar to what Mackinder was talking about. Um, it is Eastern Europe that the U.S. is very much focused on. So what we are having now is a U.S. that is acting in the Pacific and in Eastern Europe, in between the Baltic and the Black Sea, while talking, obviously, to the European counterparts and, as I said, supporting um, some European counterparts' actions that relate to global security, after all. Now, in the region, because I got to the very nearby region, we have some very critical questions going on and a window of opportunity as well. The critical question of the day is Belarus. To be honest, at Geopolitical Futures, I kind of got bored with Belarus during the last two years. Belarus and Central Asia being um, the two topics that we were talking about as the neighborhood of Russia was going to be hit after Ukraine with substantial crisis considering the weakening of Russia inside. So Belarus was to come first because it is only natural. It is more European than Central Asia. Actually, Central Asia is not European. Belarus is next to Ukraine, and Belarus has been in a catch-22 for some time now, trying to balance between the West and Russia. Now, the question is not, for, for me as a geopolitical analyst, is not primarily what happens with Belarus. It is more 
how much has Russia weakened? And from this, what kind of actions will Russia take? And how will those actions make us in Central Europe, Central and Eastern Europe, react to Russian actions? So in a way, uh, the Belarusian question is the Russian question. And in history, obviously, it has always been the case that nothing in the periphery of Russia has been only about the periphery, but has been about Russia. For Belarus, it's more than um, Ukraine, and it is Ukraine as well. What happens in Belarus will tell us what happens in Ukraine next, and more importantly, it will tell us what happens in Western Ukraine and in Eastern Europe. And I am referring here to those layers of society and socioeconomic problems that we've seen growing and accelerating during the pandemic. In Western Ukraine, we have a lot of players and a lot of socioeconomic elements. And I'm going to refer to one story that relates to hybrid warfare and information warfare. Um, it's a sort of a weekend story um, in Western Ukraine. When you go on a Sunday in some villages there, you will have pretty much all the religions in the region, except maybe Muslim uh, religion, being very widely represented. And it happened that um, on such a street, there were two churches, Catholic and Uniat Church, next to one another, actually in front of one another, not next to one another. And as the volume went up from one, the volume went up from the other side. That speaks of social, that speaks of economics, that speaks of the very intimate elements of a community that can be extrapolated by players in the vicinity and that can bring in less peace to the vicinity, to Eastern Europe. I'm referring here first of all of Russia, but I'm also referring to the coalition and the level of partnership that should exist between the countries in Eastern Europe. And we have the partnership between Poland and Romania. We also know of Hungary being in a sort, in a catch-22 too. Um, always the outlier and the question mark of the region. Um, and therefore, all this to say that in the region, it is more than ever important to understand First, how much has Russia weakened? What kind of actions will that grow? And second, how much cooperation is between us? Um, it, the two questions come together because it's a action and reaction kind of relationship, I guess. Uh, it also comes to challenge, in a way, the cohesion and the reality of the European Union. We hoped that the European Union is going to be the answer, and we still hope, I've been educated, so I have the best excuse to still hope that the European Union is going to be the answer of our geopolitical challenges of tomorrow. Um, and obviously, what goes on currently within the negotiations that relate to the very definition of the European Union will tell us how much European Union will have to do with the questions that are very much related to our own security. And I'm not referring here only to Eastern European security. We already know that national interests come first. So it is related to Europeans' security, considering economic ties and considering society-related ties that we have and share. And with that, because it's an open question, um, I am going to close my remarks and look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Antonia. Um, 
Actually, it was a very interesting uh, session. Uh, I would suggest that uh, I extend uh, by uh, 10 minutes to allow for questions and answers. Uh, and now I'm handing over uh, the floor to uh, uh, notre ami uh, Emmanuel Dupuis, uh, um, uh, president of the Institute for European Perspective and uh, uh, Security. Uh, I would say already an aficionado of the new strategy center. Soyez le bienvenu encore chez nous. And now uh, we are looking forward to uh, your, uh, how to say, uh, con concluding uh, overview of uh, this panel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, merci beaucoup hein, pour votre accueil. Uh, um, I would like, again, to thank the organizer since it is the first time on personal um, expectation that I see my colleague again, so I'm very happy to be here. I have a quite difficult task, not only because I'm finishing, but because also I understand that Ambassador Boris Ruger is not here, so I will try to show what is uh, the uh, core uh, uh, strategic uh, cooperation between France and Germany when it comes to tackling this question and so much others. You started quoting Mr. Ambassador, um, uh, German philosopher Goethe. I will quote my own Minister of Foreign Affairs, Jean-Yves Le Drian. When he was asked, what does the pandemic, what will the pandemic change? He had this phrase. The world after will look like the world before, but worse. In other words, quoting a contemporary of Goethe, the Prussian general, military terrorist, theorician, Karl von Clausewitz, in a way, the pandemic is a continuation by other means of the ongoing, everlasting fight for power amongst nations. Do remember that he mentioned the fact that war was a continuation, uh, that the war was a continuation of politics by other means. I think this, let's say, opens up our discussions. I would add to that that it is the first time that we are facing together at the same time on a global perspective, both geographical and when it comes to chronology, the same crisis. No one is left beside, no one is better, uh, is handling better or handling a different crisis. We are all handling the same crisis at the same time and this offers positive perspectives, so I will try to focus on that. And of course, uh, this uh, pandemic opens wider perspective, both on social, economical, geopolitical impact of this crisis. I will have, um, let's say, for the beginning of my presentation, five fractures or five quotes to uh, the global order as they lie before us. When I'm saying this, I have the perspective that after 75 years of UN multilateralism, we are sort of a bit of a fatigue, and this is very obvious. Uh, as the 75th anniversary of the UN is approaching in the next days. Not to say that international relations haven't changed that much with the pandemic, but as I mentioned, they have been emphasized and accelerated on these five dimensions. The first dimension is human fracture. Solidarism, humanism, idealism as drivers of the world order were already put in jeopardy by the migration crisis, by the rise of populism or by the challenge of illiberal democracy versus normal democracy, liberal democracy. And again, these uh, drivers of the world order have been heavily impacted by the pandemic, but they haven't been changing this uh, these, these, uh, perspective. I have to add that maybe they have been worsening as nationalists, sovereign reflex state, bureaucratic stances have overcome shadowed regional, transnational, united coordination response. Let's just take the lack of European solidarity. It took months for the European Union to finally decide to agree on five billion of euros of corona bonds. And again, between the beginning of this lack of solidarity and the recent days, the collapse of the positive impact of European Union has gone strong. Now, 49% of the Italians, when they are asked whether or not 
they feel confident, whether or not they still share a European perspective, 49 say they don't believe that European Union uh, is the milestone of the Italian policy. Second fracture, digital fracture. Of course, this has been mentioned by some of my colleagues. The technological tsunami uh, linked to the dematerialization of our economy, uberization of our society, the impact of big data and uh, artificial intelligence in our ecosystem has been disrupting before the crisis, but has been accelerating on behalf of the crisis. Let's say there has been a tremendous acceleration during this crisis. The five big tech, GAFAM, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, who already weighted six billion of dollars of uh, stock exchange have gone richer. Let's just take the example of Amazon. Jeff Bezos and Amazon won one billion of dollars during the pandemic crisis. Therefore, the impact of non-state economic actors is going to be stronger and stronger. We all are aware and we all have experienced the impact of the importance of Zoom in our, uh, um, in our seminar uh, environment. Third fracture, ecological fracture, again, globalized economy, industrial industry have already impact, been impacted by natural war, already impacted by natural cataclysm, cataclysm, sorry, climate change, fragility of diversity, but this pandemic, to my belief, has opened three questions. First question of three obligation. The first obligation is the urgency to fully and concretely fulfill the objective of the COP21, 2015 COP Paris-based COP21. Decarbonized objective have not been uh, put in the milestone of, the, of, of uh, international relations. I would add that the pandemic has put them a bit aside. The European Green Deal is no longer a a priority for the European Union. Second, the need to better assess our knowledge on zoonotic infections. That is the link between animal and uh, um, human uh, infections. Opening another question, the change or the necessity to overlook or reshape World Health Organization as the World Health Organization has been criticized by some countries on their lack of reactivity, not to add, the criticism about partial or punctual partiality towards some of the so-called uh, um, um, so uh, um, on China precisely, and this is again in the, in the rising of the criticism against its Ethiopian Director General Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus. The fourth uh, fracture, and we'll still have the last one, is the economical fracture. Again, I will not Focus too much on that. Disparity amongst people, amongst region, uh, were a reality. But again, uh, the generalization of social inclusion will strike harder first generation, young people who will suffer the most, and regions. Again, Africa is one of the regions which will be struck uh, the most hardly. Uh, the uh, uh, secretary executive of United Nation African uh, uh, Council mentioned the fact that to overcome the crisis in Africa, there is the need for one billion of dollars. And of course, colored revolution, Arab Spring, African wipe out of bad governance, and uh, more recently, the grievances uh, about social exclusion has been, again, a factor of demultiplication of this crisis. Finally, and I will Accelerate, it, accelerate on that. The geopolitical fracture, which to my belief opens again three questions related to that. Is the Westphalian order of 1648 still accurate? Do remember that we used to go to war for a long time and then we used to sit together, organize treaty and abide by this treaty for a certain period of time. How can that be still relevant when war between states are less relevant than infra-war or infra-war uh, uh, behaviors. Let me be precise. How do we speak with terrorist organization, non-state actors, armed groups, mafia? Can we make peace with these organizations, taking in consideration the relativity of victory 
we cannot never overcome terrorist organization. I will just take the broad example of the so-called peace agreement between the Taliban and the Americans. It's not about making peace, it's about making peace between the two and not on a global perspective. Third question, how can we trust, still trust, multilateralism uh, as the United States are no longer willing to play, I said, a regular role, 50% uh, less of their implication in WHO, their withdrawal of UNESCO in 2017, suspension of UN um, uh, relief uh, organization in Palestine in September 2018, not to mention the fact that each year, 200 million of, year of dollars are not uh, uh, fulfilled anymore concerning the, deep, the, deep, the um, uh, Department of Peacekeeping Operation of the United Nations. And I will abide by what has been said. This immediately opens a reality. Eurasian continental approach has replaced Euro-Atlantic centrality. Indo-Pacific on sea, Eurasian on land, are the new milestone of international relations. As well as the merge and the increase of legitimacy of regional organization, I will not focus on uh, that too much, but I think lie to that, lying to that, sorry, or linked to that, we see the emergency of an hybrid system of cooperation, Belt and Road Initiative, and the 77 countries linked to China uh, on that behalf is a reality. Let me now conclude and let's say I hope, open the discussion. Um, first of all, as the coronavirus comes slowly under control, I do stress on that, uh, it will take more time than we think now uh, before the global economy claws back to where it was at the start of 2020. Saying this, I have five questions. I will go very rapidly on that. Who wins, who loses? An article uh, written in May by the American-based Atlantic mentioned the fact that this crisis has allowed the emergency of positive leadership. Good leadership or scarce leadership. And playing on taking that in consideration, pragmatical, pedagogical, transparent, trustworthy approach, again, uh, was uh, mentioned uh, taking consideration the example of new Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern, and again, opposing to what my colleague said, more traditional, mild, or something, or sometimes erratic, stubborn, regressive leadership, Bolsonaro in Brazil, Donald Trump, or sharp diplomacy, new sharp diplomacy of China with, with Chairman Xi Jinping. Putting that in emphasis, again, this crisis has focused on positive, regressive differences amongst leadership. Second question, I'll go very rapidly. What comes after the pandemic? After each crisis, there is the quest or the need for new organization. In 1973, after the oil crisis, OPEC, which was created in 1960, sort of cartelized the economy, or the, the carbonized economy for and still is relevant to this extent. After the 2008 economical crisis, the G7 and the G8 were overshadowed by G20, calling for wider implication of merging states. Are we leading to a G20 to a G30? Is still G7 accurate? I will just take the example of the last G7 summit of Biarritz. It was not a G7 summit, it was a G22 implicating more states than the, uh, the organization created in 1975. And most interesting question, and again, I should add, uh, the incrementation of existing sub-regional organization. We are speaking no longer of BRICS, but of BRICS plus, no longer of OPEC, but OPEC plus, no longer of ASEAN, ASEAN plus. We are shifting and building on already uh, created organization. My uh, other comments, and again, this is completing what my colleague said, are we leading to a G2, China, America, or are we leading for a G0, where the quest for China's leadership, strategic parity, comes way sooner than expected. China was expecting this by the year 2049, 100th anniversary of the creation of Public Republic of China. Now, as German Xi Jinping said, we can assess this by 2021, creation of the Communist Chinese Party. 
And this is important, as you see the Chinese Communist Party being more and more a geopolitical actor. In other words, are we uh, experiencing or facing a new Cold War with China? Or are we preparing, or should we be preparing, and this was, I think, some of the comments of yesterday, uh, should we be preparing for war itself? And this, of course, would uh, oblige us to choose whether or not China is a strategic partner, whether or not China is a systemic adversary. I should add the same question is relevant when it comes to Russia and more stressed in this area of the world. In other words, as our colleague uh, and friend, founding dean of Lee Kuan Yew Singapore School of Public Policy, Kishore Mahu Bani, mentioned it, as China already won. In a way, is the pandemic the tool of the China's domin uh, the, the dominance? Mr. Chair, I will go very, very rapidly. Third question, how and uh, will and how Europe can take advantage of the situation? Um, there is the risk for Europe to be marginalized. There's a risk for Europe to be pushed aside. There is a risk, in effect, still relevant to consider that the European Union has not done sufficiently in terms of solidarity, in terms of urgency response. That is true concerning Italy. That is true concerning Spain. Has the European Union the sufficient tools when it comes to CSDP, when it comes to PESCO, when it comes to a realistic approach, and of course, when it comes to defending its border or the capacity to speak with the same voice on, in that regard? Not sure. Fourth, and uh, almost last uh, mention, is and how Africa will be the, uh, our common endeavor. Former Minister of Foreign Affairs, Hubert Vetrin, said that Africa is our common El Dorado, whether or not we have had a colonial or economic ties with Africa. I won't, I won't mention the demography, but just mention one figure. European Union only represents 4% of the population in the world. China, by 2000, 2100, next century, end of this century, will represent 1.4 uh, inhabitants in this planet. There will be, for the next 10 years, more African inhabitants uh, than there is, than there are uh, European um, um, citizens now. And this question opens the need to discuss amongst the European uh, Union uh, members and amongst partners about the importance of relocalization of our strategic industry. Health, textile, automobile, aeronautical can be fully fulfilled for our independence, for our autonomy, closer to the European Union not to mention along the shore of the Mediterranean Sea, for example, or along the shore of the uh, Black Sea, of course. That is to say, we must urgently open a new horizontal Euro-Atlantic, Euro-Med, Euro-Atlantic agenda. This is, I think, one of the perspective of the upcoming African Union, European Union Summit of Brussels. Last point, very rapidly. Should we take the pandemic as an occasion to reboot the old anachronic multilateralism system, or should we advance something new? I'm not speaking about a new organization, I'm speaking about a shift of sociology in inside international relations. I call that polygovernance. Instead of recreating a multilateral apparatus, why not think of bringing in new actors? Sportive, scientific, religious leadership, philanthropists, entrepreneurs, one example, Bill and Melinda Gates are more active in the fight or in the race for the Gavi vaccine islands than any other state. The poliomyelitis has now been mitigated in Africa because of the implication of non-state actor rather than the official other actors. So I think this is important. And that brings me to my conclusion. Um, if we share comments, we do have to think tank more. We do have to engage in seminar diplomacy as we are doing today. Uh, we must continue arguing the fact that it is bringing collective intelligence, but not only military to military, state to state, but cross-fertilizing cross this uh, agenda. And this brings me to understand or to just give you a final comment that globalization can rhyme with proximity 
and share of commons, and I think that, is my, that would be the most positive impact of this crisis. We understand what we have in common, and we have to work on what on, and where we still disagree. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dupuis, uh, for this uh, Cartesian uh, geopolitics. Um, now, uh, uh, I hope your hunger for uh, material food uh, will not prevail as to your hunger for questions and answers. I already have a, a question, at least one question. Uh, my uh, colleague Olivia Todaran is here. Uh, I think you have to go to the uh, uh, mic, mic over there. Okay. Yeah. Table here and also to keep people from, from eating. But I, I would still have a question for the distinguished panelists. I uh, work with the uh, MFA in, in Bucharest, in Romania, and I feel the need, and it's up to the moderator to see if also the online uh, speakers uh, will be able or not to uh, give a brief answer. I'd be really interested. Already, Monsieur Dupuis went uh, to this direction, but as I was listening to everyone for, for such a um, kind of complementary picture, but rather on the worrisome side, I feel the need to, to balance a bit the debate, and I would ask each of them, to the extent we, we have the time, to, to tell us what do they see as the biggest opportunity of this crisis in, in, in each of the speakers' view. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Olivia. Now, uh, as a matter of uh, courtesy, I think we have to ask our online uh, guests if they are still present uh, and if they are willing to answer. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Dr. Powell, you are ready? Yes. To pick the yes. challenge. And Mr. Cocker, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Powell. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to uh, bring your attention to a very interesting article published in the latest issue of Foreign Policy magazine by Una Hathaway and Scott Shapiro. And what they basically argue is that um, in keeping with this idea that the crisis is accelerating basically uh, the restructuring of the international order, um, I think I see a window of opportunity for what these authors refer to as global clubs. Um, I can describe this very briefly. Um, this is based on the idea that we all know what private goods are, and we all know what public goods are. There's an interesting new concept, which is the idea of club goods. This is a concept that was actually coined by James Buchanan back in 1965. So the idea basically is that there are club goods which are openly available, but also excludable. And I don't have time to elaborate on this, but a very good example of a successful global uh, club, of the, uh, sorry, uh, of, a, of a club good of this kind is the 1987 Montreal Protocol on substances that deplete the ozone layer. So the idea basically is that since the multilateral institutions that we have obviously pretty weak and incapable of dealing with many of the challenges we're facing, the pandemic being an excellent example. And since um, individual nation states, however powerful and however significant, are also either unwilling or unable to deal with uh, these kinds of challenges, the future may lie in the emergence of these global clubs um, and basically, you know, they will be thematically determined. So some of them will deal with issues like climate change or um, health pandemics and so on. Obviously, they will not replace existing international institutions, which will continue to, to exist, of course, but will also continue, I think, to lose importance because basically, um, I think if, if we want to see this in a positive light, we should perhaps acknowledge that the existing um, order was had serious legitimacy problems, efficiency problems, and inclusiveness problems. So I see this as an attractive way of arguing in favor of um, the, the possibility that 
these club goods may uh, lead to the creation of um, clubs which bring together like-minded states to deal with specific challenges. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Powell. Um, I am uh, extending now the floor to Professor Cocker. Are you, are you there? Are you with us? Yes, I'm still with you. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, let me, uh, since you've asked me to identify opportunities, um, let me identify, although my role in life is normally to uh, stress the bad uh, side of things rather than the good. Um, I think this crisis has, has a chance of bringing Western countries back together again. Now, I, at the, the risk of uh, arguing against my own point that we need greater cooperation, I certainly uh, am not arguing in favor of a, a Cold War with China, but I am arguing in favor of greater Western resilience. The word resilience has appeared in our discussions in the last hour or so. And the West, I think, came into this crisis deeply divided, um, not helped, of course, by Trumpism, not helped by its own responsibility for the financial crisis of uh, 12 years ago, but really a, a, a lack of self-confidence, and indeed I would say a lack of self-esteem. And um, what we've seen now is a wake-up call. Uh, a wake-up call about China, first of all, which uh, if you look at the, the recent um, uh, press conference in uh, Berlin uh, the other day, shows that the European Union is, I think, fully aware now. Uh, of the, the dangers China poses. Uh, last year it identified it, as you recall, as a systemic rival. The United States uses a different language. It sees China as a strategic rival. Systemic or strategic, the fact is, we've identified there's a China problem. I think it's a potential problem which could get worse. Therefore, we must work more closely with China if we can, but not at the risk of undermining our own position in the international system. The other thing I think that we should seize upon is the, uh, I wouldn't say collapse, but the reduction in Chinese soft power. Uh, China is now very unpopular in South Korea, in Japan, in Australia, um, in Thailand increasingly, where young people uh, now identify it as uh, being pro the military regime that they've had running the country for the last few years. Again, this is not to suggest that we push ourselves into a confrontational Cold War position, but it is to remind us that there is something called a liberal world order. There is something called a Western value system, and that those values are universal in the sense that they do appeal outside the Western world. Now is the time, I think, for reinforcing that position. And also, in terms of our response to the virus, been, I think, very significant that uh, Western countries have, I think, been much more attentive to civil rights uh, and freedoms in dealing with this epidemic uh, or pandemic than uh, other countries have been. So Mubabani's book, yes, uh, of course, uh, he believes that China has won. Um, he wrote a book a few years ago called Has the West Lost It? The West had been losing the plot. I think now is the time to reaffirm uh, the, the value system, and that's, I think, an opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, now, uh, I am returning to our uh, uh, three-dimensional panel, so to say. <laughs> Who is uh, willing to, uh, to pick up the answer? Mr. Dupuy. Very short uh, comment, direct comments, three comments. Um, what is the Western opportunity, as our colleague uh, mentioned? I think we should try to modelize common response to uh, the merge or the re-emerging uh, civilizational base state agenda, the return of empires, Turkey, Russia, China. This is obvious when certain number of states or regions, Central Asia, Caucasus, Black Sea, Mediterranean, most of, moreover, Oriental Mediterranean, are facing the same agenda in regards to those states. So if we modelize a strong, robust, autonomous, uh, convergent position, exactly what I think Joseph Borrell wrote in an article three days ago, speak with China with the same language. Do not speak differently. Go together. Emmanuel Macron, when he invited uh, Chairman Xi Jinping in uh, Elysee, 
He invited Angela Merkel and Jean-Claude Juncker. So let's forget the idea that one state can speak to China. That is absolutely, has always been irrelevant. My second um, uh, assumption is um, we should take the opportunity that the pandemic has allowed to show us that besides the strengthening of state-owned responses, and of course, when it comes to health, when it comes to mitigating crises, mitigating a sanitary uh, crisis, moreover, it is the responsibility of the state, but it is not only the responsibility of the states. Citizen own responsibility, decentralized approach, or the merge of local, uh, local responses is, of course, something that we can experience not only in Europe, but everywhere in the world as a complementary response to the state own response. Third and last point, um, I was reading um, two days ago the latest report of the Pentagon mentioning the fact that China is already the biggest maritime fleet in the world. 350 vessels against 293 American vessels. What and where the difference lies is technology. We still have a technology advance. We still and we must praise to uh, advance in the same direction to defend, promote our industrial and technologies technological advances. And that is, I think, one of the major objectives of having a CSDP would be to just define the means that we need to counter or maybe to provocate in the near future or at least show of force and show with force our determination to resist to this new agenda. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, does anybody else want to, to, to take the floor? I'll be, very, I'll be very short. I think this is a big opportunity to identify our common points and our common concerns and really identify where we cooperate, where we can have a partnership, and where we can be in a sense, in a relationship of solidarity, because they are different. And it is now that based on the actions of the other, we can actually see what kind of common views and uncommon views we have. Thank you. Uh, Minister Komanescu. Yeah, uh, very briefly, I would, uh, well, once again, I, I, I need to say that uh, at this stage, I'm afraid we are not able to come up with very clear cut and uh, for long term valid evaluations. Uh, it's in this context that I want, I have two remarks. First, I, I see, starting from the, what, what the pandemic helped us to see is that there is a need of rethinking or reconsidering perhaps some of the pillars upon which our societies are built. One is, everybody, almost everybody for some months, I mean, tell me how much was, were people talking about resilience until this uh, pandemic broke up. It was, yes, I remember that, well, the EU strategy, global strategy, it's a very, I would say, the EU com uh, needs to be commended for that. But nevertheless, the debate about resilience was not that much developed. So one of the opportunities now which is opening, which is being opened, is about rethinking the relationship between what we see the, as economic growth and development and resilience. I don't want to elaborate anymore because I was referring to some points in my, in, in, uh, my uh, intervention. And second, I think that uh, still economic related. Uh, you know, there's, there have been uh, and continue to be, let's say, approaches according to which, well, there are those who favors the, uh, the minimal state, the role of a state will be as, 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 uh, as little as possible, others that uh, overtake, overstate the importance of the state and so on. What th one thing is clear, clearly coming up from uh, the experience with this pandemic. Uh, there is, a, it, it comes clear to me that uh, we should reconsider the role of the state. Everybody's asking for the governments, including those uh, uh, private companies banks and so on, which are in favor of the minimal state role, they are now calling upon the governments to help themselves. 
So reconsidering the role of the state, it seems to me to be yet another important area where one deserves to think upon. Period. Thank you so much. Well, I was indeed very privileged to moderate this uh, panel. Uh, I propose three loud cheers for the online speakers and those being here at, at the table. And then, under the uh, close uh, management of George Scutaro, I invite you to lunch, who you are uh, warmly expected. Thank you very much. Please.